That red button means we're live. Yeah. Getting the focus. And this red button. And we're rolling. Okay. Comfortable? Mm -hmm. You look that way. I'll yeah. look this way. And let's try not to hit each other's feet. <laughs> <coughs> and in fact, if we can get this up just a little bit bigger. Lock our watch. Harrison Hot Springs, British Columbia, Canada, May 13th, 1995, Dan Perez, John Green. Mr. Green, are you more certain than... Wait a minute, cut. Don't look at me, I won't look at you. Just know that the questions are coming. Mr. Green, are you more certain than ever that we are dealing with a flesh and bone primate? Or has time shaken that belief? No, I think the evidence is overwhelming that the only way you can explain the things that are actually there is with the existence of a real animal. Are you as fascinated by the Sasquatch mystery today as you were in the late 1950s? Yes, but not in the same way. I, the idea of a large non-human hair-covered primate wandering around in North America has become quite commonplace to me. What really fascinates me is the, the human reaction. Why is it that uh, this can go on and uh, none of those people who have the resources to investigate it will ever do anything? You are approaching 70 years of age. Do you, think, do you think a Sasquatch will be discovered in your lifetime? Probably not. I hope so. Odds are getting shorter. In your view, why has a Sasquatch not been discovered? Well, there isn't any good answer to that. Of course, by discovered, you have to mean that uh, the physical piece of one, at least, is in the possession of scientists who can study it and pronounce with authority that they, there is a new species of animal um, discovered in terms of people seeing them. It goes on all the time. Okay. Do you think the discovery of a Sasquatch would be the biggest finding in the history of this planet? No, no. It would be accepted as quite a normal sort of animal after the first excitement, I would think. Well, Getting back to that question once more, do you think it would be one of the more di significant discoveries hailed here on this planet? Well, in zoology it would be very significant. Um, the most widespread species, wild species on Earth from all the reports, the only one that walks approximately the way humans do, and big and living right among us, it would certainly be. Uh, tremendous interest. What do you think would happen if a Sasquatch were discovered today from a religious, scientific, environmental standpoint, and what would you like to see happen? I don't think there'd be any great religious significance. Uh, scientifically, certainly, there would be a, a whole new field of study in the a different sort of animal, and, and in the fact that uh, we had failed to, to recognize its existence, all sorts of aspects of that could be significant. Uh, whether they, I'm sure there would be protected areas established for them. I, I'm not sure that they need any, except probably in Florida, but I expect that would happen. And so it might have an effect on the logging industry, for instance. Getting back to the religious aspect of that question, uh, if they hold in a Sasquatch today, would this be fuel for the creationist or fuel for the evolutionist? I'm sure I don't know. Probably both make use of it. Okay. What specifically did you know about the Sasquatch legend as a boy growing up in Canada? And did you have any idea 
there may be substance behind the legend. Well, there were occasional newspaper stories, not even one a year, but from time to time stories about the Sasquatch. I was living in Vancouver and uh, be in the daily papers there or in the, in the magazine section, I think, primarily. And these would, the source for these, or the, he would actually write them himself, would be a, a man named J.W. Burns who lived on the Chehalis Indian Reserve. And he was variously described as a teacher and as an Indian agent. Perhaps he may have been both during his career. But, uh, you know, we just thought they were yarns and they were, you, you never, never considered there was anything real in okay. involved. Had you grown up in Nepal, do you think somehow, some way, you would have gravitated to become an abominable snowman investigator? No, I don't. It's, I only got involved with this because I happened to buy a newspaper in the area where these stories came from. Okay. Your early days as an investigator, did you have preconceived ideas about this mystery? Well, the idea that was current, at least in the white culture, was that uh, these were some kind of giant Indians with long hair on their heads. But uh, I don't recall anything of a hairy body. There, there may have been. I, you know, I don't remember the stories particularly well. And, uh, of course, once the started getting actual descriptions. What they were describing was a very large ape that walked up right. So that was the total change. Knowing what you know today, if you were asked to redo all of your Sasquatch research from 1958 to the present, what would you do differently? Knowing what I know today, I would do anything that's possible to stay down in Bluff Creek in 1958 and do something about it then and there. The thing was coming along every week or ten days at that time and nothing like that has happened yet. at any time since, like 37 years ago. So looking back, do you think yourself and the Pacific Northwest Expedition could have been highly effective had you stood your ground? Well, remember that uh, most of this had stopped before that ever started. Uh, it would go months between footprint finds. Uh -huh. So, no, they had to, had it continued another couple of years, the reports became more frequent in 1963 and 64, and, but nothing like 1958. Is there any possibility, Mr. Green, that what we collectively call the Bigfoot phenomenon is strictly North American mythology and folklore? No, it's not mythology or folklore. It doesn't fit in that discipline any more than it does with the acceptable zoology. But, uh, moreover, it's not just North American. These reports come from all over the world, on every continent, including Australia. What, in your estimation, John, is the probability of any of these hairy bipeds existing? And what is the probability of more than one species to account for the reports? Well, I'm quite certain that at least one species exists, and in order to uh, account for the different descriptions in places like the Himalayas and in Russia, there's certainly a strong suggestion that there are two or three species at least. After graduate school in New York, did you have the slightest idea that you would go on to become one of the premier Sasquatch investigators in the world? Of course not. North American scientists, why are they so reluctant to pursue this problem and have their attitudes changed since the late 1950s? I don't understand the reluctance overall. I mean, any particular individual is easily easy to understand. But you have here by now quite a massive body of material that has been accumulated by amateurs. And that only has two earthly explanations. Uh, either there is a, a very fascinating large undiscovered animal, uh, or else there's some very strange human behavior that's 
been going on all over the world and throughout recorded history in order to manufacture evidence for the existence of an animal that isn't actually there. So it would seem to me that any institution that uh, has resources to study both animals and, and human behavior, they went to get to the bottom of this with a team approach, they have a sure winner. And of course, science expends tremendous resources on things that uh, are not certain to produce anything and uh, in many cases aren't going to produce much even if they're 100% success. Now this is something big either way and yet nobody will touch it. I find that the most fascinating thing of all. Is it scientifically irresponsible and negligent not to investigate Sasquatch reports? Well, you can't say that of any particular individual or institution. But overall, it's, I don't know that it's irresponsible, but it's very strange. Donald Johansson, Richard Leakey, Jane Goodall, have any of these prominent scientists approached you about your investigation and research into the Sasquatch puzzle? No, never. Jane Goodall made some uncomplimentary remarks because I quoted her as saying that uh, chimpanzees should be used for health experiments. Apparently she had changed her mind in the meantime. I ran into Louis Leakey once when we were both giving talks at the, uh, UCLA in Los Angeles. I showed him a footprint cast, but he showed no interest whatsoever. Recently, you finished up on a computer survey of Sasquatch reports. Tell us about it. Well, 25 years ago, we, we did a survey that involved going back and re-interviewing witnesses with a standardized form. And we got something between two and 300 reports from that. But... Uh, it wasn't adequate, and, and the computer technology wasn't adequate either. What I've done now is to put those reports into a, a modern... ...to do more than the old mainframes would do in those days. And also enter all the information from my files, which, uh, of course, is, doesn't cover nearly as many points as it something done with a proper interview, and uh, the main purpose of that is to give me access to the information that's in the file. Uh, I can now check any particular point in a very short time where previously, uh, you know, if I wanted to know, for instance, uh, whether they were farther north in the summer than they were in the winter, well, no way I could do it. So essentially, you're using the computer to look for particular themes in the reports. At this point, that's what I'm doing. I'm also making it available to answer questions other people might have. I've got about more than 1,300 reports there. And I'm hoping to hear from people with advanced skills, either in computers or zoology, statistics, some, any line that might have a bearing on this. Or there are a couple of geographers who are working on it, uh, where they can bring skills to the use of the database that I don't have. Uh, of course, there's, there's no suggestion that this is going to result in being able to go and find one. That approach is just a lot of nonsense at this stage. Maybe if you had several thousand reports with full details of vegetation, weather and weather patterns and so on like that, maybe it would work, but that would be many years down the road. You appear to skirt perilously close to the idea that dogs have an instinctive fear of Sasquatches. Tell us about that. Well, there are many reports where people describe dogs that are not normally showing any symptoms of fear of anything. Go and cower somewhere on occasions when they have some reason to believe these things are around. And the interesting thing about that is that if dogs do instinctively fear them, that would be an instinct that was 
evolved in the old world, not in North America. Do you think it takes an open-minded individual to pursue reports of the Sasquatch? Open-minded is good, stubborn is better. Okay. You've got a, you know, a lot of people looking down on you. Be willing to ignore the opinions of the majority. What is the biggest public misconception about the ongoing Sasquatch mystery? Well, there's a lot of misconceptions. The very name Bigfoot spreads a misconception that there's only one. There would have to be thousands in order for them to be there at all. There are people who either through lack of knowledge or, or for uh, reasons that are not very good and not, you know, for their own profit and so to speak are, are spreading the story that they would be an endangered species which is more nonsense no evidence that humans have ever done anything to interfere with even one of them actually and uh, also that uh, there's some kind of humans closely related to humans that you can communicate with them. You know, all these, these there's nothing in the information that indicates anything but a strictly animal existence. Many people have equated the abominable snowman as being white in color, possibly because the snow is white in that area. But very few reports indicate abominable snowmen to be white. Is that another misconception that you've encountered by way of communication with people? I don't have any particular knowledge of the abominable snowman. I didn't have the impression that people thought they were white. Um, with regard to the Sasquatch, there are certainly a substantial number of reports of light-colored ones, some of them white, but the, the vast majority of the reports are dark, very dark black. How much funding has the Canadian government poured into the Sasquatch search? Zero, as far as I know. And the United States government? Same answer. Are you satisfied that the frozen carcass of an alleged Bigfoot, known as the Minnesota Iceman, and also dubbed Bozo, was simply a carnival fabrication? That's what I think it was. Uh, but I, you know, I've never studied that closely either. One thing I'm sure of is that it's nothing to do with Sasquatch or Bigfoot. If it's real, it's some kind of primitive human. It doesn't match the Sasquatch descriptions at all. Is there any evidence of migration and hi hibernation in the report? None that I've ever found or that anyone has ever shown me, other than the possibility of uh, you know, just maybe traveling a couple of hundred miles to an area that's more desirable at a time of year. Not much, see very little of that. Some of the foot tracks that appeared in Bluff Creek, California in the 50s and the 60s apparently proved to be one-time deals. Why do we not find long series of tracks alongside dirt roads today? Are Sasquatches on to us? I think you have to assume that they develop an instinct for not leaving their tracks. It's something they do only occasionally or under exceptional circumstances. You know, since they're basically at the top of the food chain today, I would imagine that's an instinct they would have had to develop in a different era altogether. <coughs> and there were larger and more dangerous animals that they had to fear. I don't think there's anything take any great intelligence to figure out that it's just as well not to leave a trail. Mm -hmm. Lots of animals that are hunted by scent are credited with trying to confuse their scent trail. Jumping off a tangent from that question, uh, something we discussed earlier, when was the last time you saw good tracks? Personally. Really good ones that I yeah. have no doubt about? 30 years ago almost. Does that trouble you? No, it's, uh, I would like to be there to see some more, but if I'm 
showing up as rarely as they do and communications are as bad as they are, it's no surprise. You were in the Bluff Creek, California area three times in 1967. Did the thought ever cross your mind that someone was going to get a movie film of one of the creatures from that region? No, I didn't expect that to happen. Well, I, I thought it would happen sooner or later somewhere. Were you surprised that it was make a movie, so he, he at least would be in a good location with a camera. In your opinion, the 1967 tracks that were discovered on Blue Creek Mountain, California, <coughs> any possibility that they could have been fake? I don't think so. There must originally have been more than a thousand of them. We counted about 600. Traffic had wiped out a lot of them. And they appeared to all have been made in a very brief time and a little film of wet, a little muddy film on top of a deep layer of dust. <coughs> it was very hot weather and uh, it rained very little, just one little sprinkle. So they, someone faked them, they had to work at amazing speed. And uh, there was so much difference in the individual tracks, tow motions and so on. That You'd have had to carve them, and I don't say I could have done that, especially since there were pressure cracks around some of them. If Bob Gimlin would have fired a clean shot on the sandbar in 1967, do you think he would have killed the subject in Roger Patterson's film? Yes, I'm quite sure he would. He's six at close range, and he's a good shot. Right? Putting the cat... Pat Putting the Patterson-Gimlin case aside, what is the best report that you have investigated? Well, I think the report I would like the best is one I didn't really investigate, and that's William Rowe, way, way back in the beginning, because uh, he was able to observe at close range without being seen what the thing was doing when didn't know there was a human present, and then he was able to track it. Mm -hmm. see what it was doing and um, my contact with him was by letter and then he went and wrote out an account and had it notarized and then subsequently I, I learned talking to zoologists who had worked with him that uh, he was considered to be a very competent wildlife observer and they'd been getting information from him about buffalo Albert Ostman, who claimed to have been kidnapped by a Sasquatch in 1924, said his abductors did not look like the subject in the Patterson Gimlin film. Do you feel his story was fabricated? Well, what he said was that the one, one in the film wasn't one of the ones he saw. Mm -hmm. uh, an illustration that he did like but was still quite a bit like the one in the film. And uh, I don't think that his story of his observations could have been fabricated. But whether you could extend that to uh, being carried off in a sleeping bag or uh, escaping by feeding the thing snuff, you know, there's, there's no way to check any of that. But uh, I did have him questioned by two experts in ape anatomy. One of them, uh, the head of a team that was doing this atlas of comparative anatomy of apes and men and they grilled him all one afternoon and uh, said afterwards that if he hadn't seen those things the way he said he had he had certainly become a, an expert on the anatomy of higher primates somewhere or another it just apparently didn't say anything that seemed to them out of place and uh, you know, his, his history was that he was a logger. Of course, I suppose he might have been employed in a zoo as a young man or something. It's possible. I also had him cross-examined by a magistrate who had been a criminal lawyer who was so rough on him that I was quite embarrassed about having exposed him to him. And uh, that man also felt that he was telling the truth. 
What persistent themes do you find troubling in your research? Reports of Sasquatches on all fours, three code tracks, excessively brilliant eye shine at night? Well, there's no problem with it being on all fours. You could probably find as many reports as a higher percentage of humans being on all fours. Uh, eye shine at night reflected is no problem. It's normal for an animal that's nocturnal, which this apparently is. Eye shine in the daytime, though, that's a real problem. No explanation for that. And uh, three toed footprints. They're not as commonly reported as most people think. In fact, in my record, there are more four toed reports. Well, the, the three toed are more common in the East, which I haven't got in the computer. But, uh, you know, that's troubling, all right. But there are a few humans that, a uh, mutation that has only two toes, so certainly not impossible. Are these the ostrich people from Africa? That's right. Yeah. Okay. What are your overall impressions of the information that has come to light from the Walla Walla area, Washington State, 1982 to present? Well, prior to 1982, there were reports from there, and it's a very good area, mm -hmm. and promising-looking area. So I don't doubt that there are still some good reports coming from there, but it's been established beyond question that there's a lot of faking going on there, so just stay away from there. And what individual has been center stage in Walla Walla? Well, there's a man named Paul Freeman that comes up with most of the stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you feel there is any substance between UFO reports in connection to Bigfoot encounters? No, I don't. I, I think you don't get anywhere trying to explain one mystery by attributing it to another mystery. And uh, I don't know of any reports in the western part of the continent that would make any direct link. Uh, I imagine if I'm nothing against the possibility of other cultures that can fly around in space in ways we can't. And, uh, I imagine they would certainly be looking at us, especially since we started having atomic explosions here. Uh, but if you know, if if there is such a thing as flying saucers, and there are any of them. Uh, seen in the vicinity of Sasquatches is probably the occupants of the saucers looking at the Sasquatches. I don't see that. As far as Sasquatches coming from flying saucers, they're a very ordinary sort of an earth animal. If anything comes from saucers, it would be us. So it's a bad connection? I think so. Okay. Of all the... Uh, what percentage of your catalog reports do you have faith in? There's a, a double answer to that. If there's no such animal, then none of the reports are any good. If there is such an animal, then there isn't any immediate reason for discounting any of the reports. So perhaps 90% of your reports you think are good? No, when you consider that there definitely is some fakery going on. Mm -hmm. And there are people who uh, would like to see a Sasquatch, and uh, there are people who make honest mistakes, I'm sure. Uh, it's probably, probably even under 80%. But uh, it would be a high figure. If there is such an animal, why wouldn't it be? How many African-American people do you know how many African-American people do you know of that have claimed sightings? Offhand, I can only think of one, and that's a very old report from Georgia. Do you, do you find that peculiar? Well, I hadn't given it any thought until you brought it up. Uh -huh. uh, there are not very many African-Americans in this part of the continent. But, uh, yes, it is peculiar. 
Why is it that no hunter has ever killed a Bigfoot? I don't have any good answers to the questions, why has something never happened? <laughs> or why it's not likely to happen nearly as much as one may expect. Lots of reasons. In most cases, it would be because uh, I thought it was some kind of a human because of the way it was walking. Okay. Um, then there would be people who would be just too frightened or startled to, to shoot or to shoot straight. And of course, there's a few people who say they did shoot them, but there's nobody that I know of that's ever said they followed one after they shot it. So it's quite possible that humans have killed a few. But, uh, no, I, I, I would have thought, you know, years ago that once word got out that there was this kind of an animal out there, that some deer hunter would shoot one before too long. It hasn't happened. Peter Gatella once told me that incoming data that does not fit your perception of the way things ought to be get tossed in the wastebasket. Is there any truth to that? Well, I don't know just what he meant by it. Is uh, I don't file anything that doesn't involve a sighting of a hairy biped and, uh, or footprints that are roughly human in form, but too large to be a human. So, uh, some things that I, I might wish now that I had a record of, smells and sounds and uh, dogs being killed, this kind of thing, uh, I haven't filed. Uh, he may be just speaking about uh, reports that, that link flying saucers with Sasquatches, which is or something that he takes seriously. If there's a report of something being seen in the sky in the same general time period in the same general area, I don't make that link. Other people do. Um, the other thing is that for a long time I ran an information exchange where people sent me reports and I sent out to everybody in the exchange copies of the file cards that I made uh, he may be just talking about the file cards. But the fact that something wasn't on a file card doesn't mean I threw it away. Okay. Peter Byrne has claimed publicly and in print three different sizes, 14 and one half inch, 15 and a half inches, and 16 inches of a foot track apparently found in Northern California in the early 1960s. What do you make of this gross inconsistency and what do you make of Peter Byrne? Well, for Peter Byrne to tell any story that suits his purpose at the time, and of course these aren't stories, these are the same identical photograph, very easily identified, with very specific information as to how big it was and where, where it was seen under what circumstances, and even the kind of film the picture's supposed to have been taken with. He's got two different versions. That's just the way the man is. I wouldn't take anything seriously that comes from him. Your 1976 trip across the United States, what things were confirmed on that outing? Basically that there were serious investigators and uh, witnesses of the same sort that we were accustomed to, to dealing with here. Could be found in the other places we went. New Mexico, Texas, Florida, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Montana, probably a couple of others I've missed. Uh, but at that point that I you know, had to accept that if we had them in the west, they were in the east as well. And of course I learned that there's plenty of habitat, places that we tend to think of as being very heavily settled and occupied. There's well, Ohio, for instance, a sports columnist said they issue 300,000 deer hunting licenses a year. Pennsylvania, in eastern Pennsylvania, you drive for hour after hour after hour. It's almost all wild. So the potential to hide Sasquatches in North America is far greater than most people imagine. Yeah, even in New Jersey, which 
one of the most highest populations per square mile anywhere in the United States. There's a, a big area, that, uh, a bog area, where uh, there were reports of something called the Jersey Devil. And, uh, might be this, but has a lot of other descriptions. But uh, away from there, there are other rural areas with lots of forests. Um, not not like British Columbia, where there might be one road in 300 miles. Yeah. Plenty of room for an animal. 20 inches of rain. Is that a good argument for the existence of Sasquatches? Not particularly for the existence, but uh, what that is, is that the area where there are any number of reports at all is a pretty fair match for a, a rough area of a heavy place where there's more than 20 inches of rain a year. And where there's less than 20 inches of rain a year, there are very few reports. And the thing that's always intrigued me about that is that television programs, for instance, are always having a scientist to give balance, I suppose, to anything they do on this subject, and, and they're very quick to say that mankind has an inherent need to imagine monsters. They don't seem to be required to produce any evidence of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, uh, why does this inherent need dry up where there's less than 20 inches of rain a year? Okay. Now, your immediate reaction would be, well, it's the vegetation that makes the difference. But it doesn't, because there isn't any good match with a vegetation map. What was it like being the colleague of the world-famous zoologist, Ivan Sanderson? Well, I wasn't really a colleague. I met him once when he came to see me for a few days, and we used to correspond and talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. He was a very likable fellow. He and I got on very well. I enjoyed the relationship. But I, you know, I wasn't close to any of the other things he was doing. Mm -hmm. Did you think the multi-millionaire Thomas Slick and his Pacific Northwest expeditions would collect the Sasquatch? I had considerable hope that they would, yeah. They, uh, they were still... Well, what they call Bigfoot was turning up every once in a while and footprints every once in a while. To have people out there full-time hunting it, people with hunting skills and with dogs and so on. Could have happened. <coughs> Your reaction to Tom Swift's unexpected death, do you think there could have been foul play at work? Well, I don't know any specifics other than the plane blew up in midair, which is not something planes normally do. Mm -hmm. A few people stick with anything for any length of time. Are you intrigued that Rene de Hinden, Bob Kipnis, and yourself, all Canadians, all members of the Pacific Northwest Expedition from the late 50s and early 60s, are still active in this investigation after three and a half decades? I think it's basically a coincidence, but it is unusual. Tetmuth, by the way, was Californian, Canadian now, but he, okay. he came to Canada in the course of looking into these things. And, uh, well, of course, a lot of the other people who've come into it since have never seen evidence as good as what uh, we saw down there. That might have something to do with it. Any possibility that Sasquatches are indigenous to North America, in spite of no fossil record? Well, you're, you're getting into archaeology, which is, I have no particular expertise, but certainly it's accepted that all the higher primates evolved in Africa, so these would have to have done the same. How is it that these creatures perhaps a holdover from a prehistoric time, has been a success at survival. Well, all, all surviving creatures are holdovers from a prehistoric time. and uh, These are of a particular success because they, are, they cover such a wide area and 
atmospheric climates and so on. Uh, they can see in the dark. They're, they're very intelligent for an animal. They've got a good fur coat. Uh, they're extremely fast, extremely strong, and uh, can apparently digest just about anything that any other animal can. And I also understand that the reports indicate these animals can swim. Yes, and they indicate they can swim very well underwater. So, uh, they've got a lot going for them, no question about that. In a sense, an all-terrain creature, huh? Yes, definitely. They may also be able to hibernate. Your reflections of the 1978 Monster Conference at the University of British Columbia? I think it was the best such conference there's been. And people put a, quite a lot into preparing papers for it and brought a lot of people together. certainly the most serious academic conference has ever been. Um, it was divided in two. It also covered the uh, stories of hairy bipeds from mythology and so on, and there was just no uh, common ground at all between the people in the two fields. It was almost like having two different conferences going on. Although that's where I learned that it's the Sasquatch stories don't fit mythology or folktale. They just don't have the proper characteristics. Well, think about it. I mean, what you've got usually is somebody who says, I saw this thing run across the road in the headlights the day before yesterday. This is the third in Hot Springs annual Sasquatch Forum. In a small way, it's doing the larger conferences I've done gets people like our gives us a chance to talk to each other. Um, but there's not much being comes out of anything. A few new reports each time so bring in a, a witness from a very good story that most of us have to previously. industry has adopted an active debunking policy when it comes to theft? No. No, I don't. I don't think they've identified Sasquatch reports as a major problem. Six. A young René de Hinden stepped into your... What transpired in that initial meeting? Well, he came there having been told Sasquatch stories by a man he worked for on the prairies and planning to just come and hunt one and hunt them. So I tried to persuade him that uh, this was foolish. And when he wasn't prepared to listen to me, I sent him off to see some of the uh, very experienced hunters and tell them the same thing. But being Rene, he didn't uh, pay too much attention. Page 32 of Barbara Wasson's book, Sasquatch Apparition, states, Rene says Green is the only one with whom he can truly communicate about the Sasquatch. What are your thoughts about Rene de Hinden, your former colleague? Well, in the beginning, we... Uh, saw things pretty much the same way and, and uh, were able to cooperate and he moved here to Harrison Hot Springs. We saw a great deal of him and his family. Went on all sorts of outings together and uh, you know he was well, one of my very closest friends. Uh, but over the years uh, I became more and more of the opinion that no individual had any real hope of getting one of these. And that uh, sharing of information was the logical way to go. And uh, he stayed very strictly with the approach that uh, a prospector has when he's looking for the mother load. He, you want to succeed yourself, therefore you don't share anything that's uh, promising with anybody else. Well, of course, just put everything we had in the early years we had in common, and uh, we reached the point where he felt 
actually betrayed because uh, I would share information with other people that he considered was his. So, you know, under those circumstances, it was more and more difficult to work together, and eventually we stopped having really no contact to speak of anymore. When, when was your last... It's, it's well known in Sasquatch circles that the both of you have had a falling out. When was the when did the association dry up? Oh, sometime in the seventies. Gradual. Page sixty seven of your book, Sasquatch the Apes Among Us, you wrote the following about tracks found in Northern California in nineteen fifty eight. In part it read, Deep down, I had never expected that there would be anything to see. What more can you add about those deep down doubts early on? Well, that's more a matter of uh, the way I react to things. Uh, when I go fishing, I never really expect to catch a fish. <laughs> if I was a hunter, I would never really expect to get an animal. I just don't have the feeling that it's going to happen. Of course, with fishing, quite often it does. <laughs> Uh, by that time, I was pretty well convinced that uh, there was something to this and that there should be tracks to see. Mm -hmm. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I didn't anticipate actually seeing any. Particularly when the man that we'd followed to this location came and he couldn't keep up with him and he'd been there a little while when we arrived. And he said I, he was very sorry, but they, they backbladed all the good tracks just that morning. I thought, oh yeah, sure, what would you expect? But then he said, just look around and you'll find some. And I opened the car door and there was a track right there in the shoulder of the road. If, for the sake of argument, it could be proven that the Sasquatch mystery is a giant, gigantic hoax, was it time well spent nonetheless? Well, it's been time well spent because it's been interesting and I had a lot of fun. And for a while I even made a living with it. But uh, the question doesn't work because there's no way that it could ever be proved to have been a hoax. Right. It's just too much has happened over too long a time period. You can prove individual things to be hoaxes. Uh, and it's just unimaginable that there could be an organized conspiracy with all the records to prove that all these things over the centuries have, have been faked. You have never seen a Sasquatch. Do you think you ever will? Not likely. When you die, how do you wish to be remembered? When I die, I won't care. <laughs> okay, now, stay seated. I'm going to take this one camera and do just get a shot of both of us together, and I'm going to return yeah. to my chair. Oh! Foot asleep? I my foot fell asleep. Fell asleep, John. And as you were looking before, and I'm going to continue to look in the same direction to get maybe a few seconds of this. So when we integrate the footages, we're together on tape. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we would put music in on the spot. Well, I never had the sun in my eyes. No, it's been good. This 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 one here is a hell of a lot better than the first one we did. Except I hope. I